Hi, and welcome to episode 20 of our Tuesday night podcast. And tonight we're talking about DIY and how to get rid of the pests in your home. I don't like pests, I could tell you. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, for those that know me, I mean, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm like 200 pounds, six <laughs> foot. And uh, there's nothing that makes me squirm more than pests, especially when they're in my home. So we're going to go over the top eight critters that can invade your home and talk about how to get rid of them. And I have an expert uh, here with me tonight and uh, Foster Brushka. Uh, he's a trainer and a consultant with a business called Pest Posse. He actually teaches other pest management companies, I think all around the country, but he'll, he'll polish up on that. And he's been in the pest management business for almost 30 years. I'm Todd Sachs. I am your host tonight. I'm a real estate broker here in Maryland. I help buyers and sellers achieve their real estate uh, goals, no matter whether it's commercial or residential real estate. And I also help people through my broker referral network program all over the United States. So if you don't have an agent and you need one, but you just want to talk to somebody, feel free to uh, drop me a line. All of my comfort, uh, contact information is enclosed below. And uh, tonight we're going to, like I said, go over those eight common pests that uh, come into your home. And then we're going to learn why we should try and do those pesty management techniques ourselves instead of calling up the consultant. So Foster, thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, fill, in the, fill in the gaps. Yeah, well, no, thanks a lot for, for having me, Todd. I certainly do appreciate it. So yeah, so um, I'm Foster Breske. I've been with the uh, here with the Pest Posse here. This is a uh, Kind of a new thing that we've put together for pest management professionals uh, doing training and consulting for this company so that way they can perform pest control services you know kind of a little bit more professionally and really kind of take care of the homeowners the right way and you know also too offering them tips as well too because you know you don't always need to call the pest professionals a lot of times so uh yeah i've been in the industry yeah like 28 years worked for a few companies so um I think I got a little bit of experience think we can kind of help you out with this and give some of the homeowners kind of some tips to do before, you know, they need to call the, uh, the professional in and, and see what, uh, see what they can try to do themselves. Well, I've been rehabbing houses probably for the last <clears throat> almost 25 years myself. And, uh, and I could tell you, I mean, there's only been a couple situations where I've actually called in the professionals and yeah. I guess I was just feeling like I was getting beat by the <laughs> bugs and uh you know so i had to call in the the posse yeah. and uh but it, like i said it's only been a couple times so but foster kind of explain why do you recommend that people try and do it themselves well i think probably the the biggest thing is is you know the the expense as far as calling in somebody kind of especially in the, these day and age that we have you know with covid and everything had kind of having that stranger come in your house and everything so i think trying to try it yourself, um, I, I think is a good thing just so you don't have that stranger coming in, in the house. Um, a lot of times you can end up, you know, doing it yourself. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with doing that. There are some good materials that are available out there in the marketplace that people can buy. Now you just got to make sure you read and follow the instructions. So, um, so yeah, so there's, you know, that's, that's a couple of reasons why it's okay for the homeowners to do it. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with it. Like I said, there's, there's some good things out there and some good products out there now that really can, uh, can, can take care of the, uh, the pests that you've got. So and there's ways to do it too, that we can talk about if you'd like, as far as, you know, where you don't need to use pesticides, where you can do things is what we call an integrated pest management approach. So can, uh, homeowners buy the same products that the professionals buy? Um, yeah, unfortunately they can. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of the products that, that you find like at Home Depot, you find like at Lowe's, uh, your local, um, those, those are a little bit better, I would say to buy than trying to go online and buying materials that us pest professionals would use because really with the materials that are being used these days, Todd, you really got to make sure that you're applying them correctly. You got to make sure that you're mixing them correctly because if you put too much material inside a sprayer and you think, okay, it says one ounce and you put in five ounces, well, now you're just spraying water because of the science behind it. So a lot of the materials you get through the local, 
you know, hardware store and everything. It's pre-mixed. It's in a spray bottle. Um, it's okay to use those and works fine. And there's, there, there are things you can buy um, that we do use, um, you know, through Amazon. And there's a couple of uh, do-it-yourself pest control companies that are out there online. You can get things. You just, you just got to be a little bit careful with it and making sure if you're, if you are buying things online, that is what the professionals are using it. You make sure you wear your safety glasses. You make sure you wear, you know, some gloves, long sleeve. Make sure you just protect yourself. So, so it's not like, uh, you know, like I want to divide and conquer and you yeah. know just kind of go after these things. So, you know, more isn't necessarily better. So, exactly. a lot of the what I hear, a lot of the risk that is involved when you're dealing with pesticides, mm -hmm. just like you're saying, I guess in the mixing or preparing the spray stage, mm -hmm. you're taking those high concentrate levels and then mixing it yourself. So yep. um, you recommend stay away from those sites, just go to Home Depot, Lowe's, yep. just get those um, already uh, prepared containers, even though you may spend a little bit more money. Exactly, yeah, that, that's exactly it, yeah. And, and there are some, really the, the advent of essential oils and what we call natural green products have come a long way in the industry. There is, there's one company that's called nature side, um, that I would recommend, you know, any homeowners checking out you can buy that stuff online. It is pre-mixed. It is in, it is in, you know, dispense bottles and stuff and squirt bottles and it works great. And it's, it's probably one of the best ways and probably one of the better materials to really use for, for homeowners. Cause again, it's a green product. It's an essential oil. Um, it's going to be a little bit less toxic than anything you're going to find out there in the market. Well, we're going to dive in and start talking about these eight common pests. And, yeah. and you're on the West Coast. I'm on the yeah. East Coast. Exactly. And, and a lot of these pests are all over the country. And they are. And some of them are all over the world. So yeah. I think that no matter where, if you're listening or watching, I think no matter where you live, I think you're going to get something out of tonight's show. Uh, but one of the common the things that I see or, or I hear a lot of professionals say is if you walk around your house, there are certain entry points that mm -hmm. a lot of these pests, um, you know, where they come in. Can you just kind of go over those? Yeah. I mean, and that really kind of goes, you know, to what I was saying there, as far as like integrated pest management, you know, you're really looking for the food, water, and and harborage areas for those insects. So yeah, when you walk around the house, I mean, as far as entry points, the biggest thing is if your house is like on a raised foundation and you see those like metal vents that are around the house, if any of those are broken or, you know, they look like they're rusty or whatever, you should replace those right away. Cause that's going to be a huge entry point for any pest, you know, especially for your rodents, your, your mice and your rats and stuff. So looking for those entry points. And then of course, if you've got, you know, any any gaps around any pipes that go into your home. Those would be anything from, you know, the condensers from the AC units that are coming to the home, making sure that there's no gaps around those. Really, any hole or anything you find around the home that is a quarter inch or bigger, you need to seal that up, um, either with, you know, some sort of steel wool, either maybe having to do some sort of wall patch with that or, you know, really try to stay away from the expandable foam because a lot of pests will just chew through that. It'll make more mess than what it's worth. So um, so when you're really looking around the outside of the home, looking at that, and then, of course, you know, you got the garage door, um, you know, yes, the actual door itself, but then the sign band door. You know, if you got, again, a quarter inch gap underneath that, you need to make sure you got a door sweep on that. So that way pests can't get into the home. Um, that's really going to help out a lot. And then you know, as far as there's more things you can look at as far as around the house, as far as keeping pests, you know, that's making sure your landscaping is is manicured and trimmed, making sure you don't have those trees that are touching the building. And those are really going to help out as well, too, as far as making sure all sorts of pests don't come in your house. Yeah. So when you're looking at the pest inside, know that they came in from somewhere. Exactly. So if you're going to start to you try and take care of the problem, first seal up the outside and make yep. sure, you know, uh, like Foster saying that these entry points and a lot of times we see um, in the real estate business, we see like Foster's mentioning wherever somebody is actually bored through the house or yeah. you know, created a hole to put the, the air conditioning line through mm -hmm. or the gas line. And a lot of times they're caulked originally yep. and through time they dry rot, they shrink and things like that. And it doesn't take very much for, you know, these pests to get inside. No. 
This one, Foster, is really big for me. And um, and I want to know myself how to get rid of these pests because yeah. ants, number one on the list. Oh, yeah. Ants. And, you know, every spring we deal with this in, in my house. So, yeah. you know, as soon as the weather starts to get warm, it's mm-hmm. it's like I have this army of ants intruding me and we deal with it despite whatever we've tried all yeah. the way until it gets cold again. Like exactly. We're in Maryland. We're on the East Coast. So we get that freezing time of the year where everything dies yep. like outside. Um, so how do we get rid of ants? Yeah, ants are, <laughs> ants are extremely difficult. I mean, because again, it doesn't matter, you know, trying to steal your home 100% from ants coming in your home. It's just, it's not going to happen because there's just, they're going to find an entryway. They're going to find a way in. They just need a very, very small little crack to get in. Um, it's, it's really tough. And I mean, I think the biggest thing is as far as trying to prevent them from getting in your home is making sure that there's no harborage areas for them outside, making sure that, you know, you don't have a lot of leaf litter and debris and stuff near the house, making sure you're keeping that away. Um, that's kind of a big thing. Uh, as far as the inside, you know, just making sure that you keep the general cleanliness up. Now, of course, yeah, they're going to get into those boxes of cereal. They're going to find those that sugar and stuff. It just depends if they're, you know, ants at certain time of the years. I mean, they're going to be looking for proteins. They're going to be looking for sugars. So it's just going to depend. And as far as them coming in seasonally, yeah, that's kind of a tough thing. Now, if you do hire a pest management professional and they are doing a regular maintenance service, that's pretty much going to stop that from happening because they're going to keep that insecticidal barrier up around the home and you're not going to have that issue. So that's going to be kind of a big thing. As far as homeowners, yeah, trying to prevent them coming in, just just those items that I said are going to be huge as far as helping them to make sure that they don't come in. Um, to you know, making sure that, like I said, keeping the trees and the bushes and everything trimmed away from the structure is going to help out a lot too because the ants will just kind of use that as a bridge to get into the house. So if you can keep any of that stuff at bay around the exterior, keeping your home clean, of any food debris. I mean, even, you know, if you know that it's a seasonal thing with the ants, you know, start keeping, you know, your cereal, your sugars, things like that. Keeping that in inside of a sealed container is really going to help out as well, too. Um, that's really going to prevent anything from coming in. So using those plastic containers, sealing that food up, that's going to help, you know, to make sure they're not attracted to that. So how about boric acid? Does that work for ants? Um, it can, um, the problem with a lot of the ant baits and stuff that you buy over the, the counter and stuff is that there's too much boric acid and then there's just too much of that concentrate in there. So it can help the, the powdered form of boric acid can help, but you need to put a very small amount and it really needs to be inside cracks and crevices, anything like that. Um, it needs to be, you know, a very fine amount put around, you know, I've seen it where it's an excessive amount of, of, you know, that boric acid or any dust put around and it's just going to repel them more than anything. So if you put a finite amount around, that's really going to help. Like I said, the stations that are there, a lot of times there's a higher concentrate of that boric acid in those stations. So that's going to, that's going to sometimes repel the ants and they're not going to want to, you know, feed on that. A lot of people think that they're taking the food to eat the food. Ants don't eat food, right? No, they don't. No, they're going to, they're basically the, the workers and everything that you're seeing out there, they're not consuming that food. They're basically taking that back to the nest to basically feed, feed the queen and to feed some of the workers a little bit that are inside that colony. But the ones that you're seeing outside, they're not eating that food really. They very rarely do they. So they're really taking that back to the nest and, and trying to build that nest up and everything. So you're absolutely yeah. right on that. I think, do they eat mold? Is that what they eat? No, typically they won't eat mold. I mean, it's going to be a rarity. They're going to do that. Like I said, they're going to go after things, you know, mold, they really don't, but they're really going to go after things. They're going to have, like I said, that sugar and that protein in them and mold really isn't going to be something that they're going to, they're going to mm-hmm. chew on. I didn't know. I just heard, I thought that uh, they take the food back and they actually, you know, make the, put it together or whatever to make this mold that they feed themselves off of. But that's, that's not yeah. true. No. no, that's not true. Yeah. That's <laughs> not true. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know. I mean, I try and hide the food from them, but it, it's just crazy. So really, yeah. um, 
you're just recommending sealing up really good, finding the yep. entry points. Exactly. And, and, um, and then just stashing the food away. All right. Exactly. The next one, the next one is roaches. So, oh, yeah. um, I have rentals and every now and then I hear, you know, Hey, I found a roach. And of course it's sort of like, um, you know, what you, what, what you hear is like, they only live in dirty apartments or people that live dirty. Is that true? Or is it, you know, what's, what's the deal with roaches? Yeah, no, they don't. I mean, yeah, they're, they're going to go after things that are dirty, but they'll even go in clean houses as well too. And it depends on the variety of roach that you're looking at. I mean, there's really, there's really three common type of roaches you're going to have. You're really going to have your German cockroaches, which are really going to be infesting your kitchen areas, your bathrooms, maybe some living spaces. A lot of times, unfortunately, those those cockroaches are going to come in. You know, if you go to Costco, you go to Smart and File, you go to some of those big bulk stores, you might bring some cockroaches back with you. And those are going to be those German cockroaches because they're really easily transported. Um, they produce worse than rabbits. Um, they can hide the aid sacks and drop those really inside the folds of the of the cardboard and everything. So when you get the rentals, a lot of times, yeah, you're going to have those because, you know, yes, if people don't keep things clean, it is going to make it so there's more food and stuff for those cockroaches to to live and breed on. Um, so that's really one when you're looking at your apartments, those are really the ones you're going to have the issues with. And then there could be something in a surrounding unit as well, too, that could be affecting that one unit that's calling saying, hey, I've found one or two roaches. So that could be something. Um, you know, your Oriental cockroaches, Turkish stand cockroaches, those are almost similar. There's going to be something from the outside. Typically won't be coming on the inside. You're not going to see those in the kitchens and the might see them in the bathrooms, maybe in the living room. And then you have your your American cockroaches and those are kind of the bigger variety. And they sometimes can fly, but not a lot of times. <laughs> and again, those will those will be more on the outside more than anything. Um, that you're going to find them. So really the common one you're going to find on the inside is going to be that German cockroach. So how do you get rid of them? Basically keeping, again, just like you do with ants, you know, keeping keeping the place clean, uh, keeping your food, you know, in sealed containers, things like that. That's really going to help as far as uh, making sure that they're not coming in. Um, you know, trying again, you know, door sweeps on doors, putting those on, that's going to help from pests not coming in. It's going to help with the cockroaches. Um, again, trying to seal up every nook and cranny is really impossible to do for all pests. You know, um, if you go to, you know, like a bulk store, something like I mentioned, you know, taking things and, and looking at them before you put them away, try not to take the cardboard from those areas, uh, those bulk stores and using them at your house, that's really going to help as well too. Um, but I would say the big thing is, is, you know, just keeping things clean keeping the food and the water and the debris, making sure you're doing the dishes every night and putting those away, uh, making sure you're drying stuff, making sure you're keeping the oven and the stove clean and the countertops clean. That's just, that's going to help out a lot with, with all those pests. What, uh, what pesticides are the best to use for the German cockroaches? I would say for the German cockroaches, really the, the best thing you're going to find is going to be any of the baits that you're going to find on there, kind of the, uh, the gel baits that you're going to find. And, putting a, a small bead around, you don't need to put like a big line, um, you know, down. That's, that's just not gonna, that's not gonna work for, for any pests, especially for the cockroaches. You need to put just really little pin drops around, uh, putting those in cracks and crevices, kind of the back of the, the cabinet areas underneath the sinks and everything. That's really going to help the, the stations that you can find. I would, I would say not to get those because what ends up happening is that the roaches will eat all the bait that are in those stations and then the roaches will use those as homes. And then now you got a big problem. <laughs> so um, the, the gel baits are usually the best thing for the cockroaches. And you say they multiply fast. So, I mean, yeah. what's that time like? I mean, do they yeah. lay eggs and they hatch and you have, you know, a thousand more in two weeks? I mean, what, what's the cycle? Yeah, it's with the German roach is pretty amazing. I mean, they just the, the female just needs to do her business once in her lifetime and she can have 30 to 40 egg sacs um, in her lifetime. And those 30 to 40 egg sacs can have anywhere from 30 to 60 babies. And really, those babies can start to make babies in about 30 to 60 days. So it's a very quick turnaround time um, that she's she's making babies and dropping them and, and they're just reproducing. So it's a very, very quick cycle that you have with the, with the German cockroaches.
So you talk about the, you know, the gel being the best thing to use as yeah. opposed to like a fogger or a bomb or something like yeah. that. You really, with any pest, you really don't want to use the fog or the bomb because that's really going to drive the pest back into wall voids, back into cracks and crevices, deep in those areas where you don't want them to be. Um, you want them to be out. So it's it's really too bad because with those foggers and those those things that are out there, they really don't do anything. And it's really, it's too bad. And they're really misused a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people, they figure, okay, well, we'll use one can is good, but you know, maybe I'll put five and then all of a sudden you have an explosion. It's because, you know, it's a, it's a flammable material. You put too much in there, it's going to be some issues. So. Yeah, and then sometimes it might go into an apartment that doesn't have any roaches. So like you're saying, they kind of go behind the walls and, and mm -hmm. uh, which leads me into the next pest, which are bed bugs. Right. Um, I have a, an experience with this. I, you know, have apartments myself, uh, like I mentioned, and I remember one time we were renovating one of the apartments and somebody had moved out and we went inside. And I mean, one of my carpenters actually took them to his house. Um, you know, they were, he was working in there. And the first thing we did was kind of like empty the contents, which was like a couch and a, a bed, right? The bed bug. So um, they were all lined on it and, and, and that's how he carried it home. But that was a problem all in itself. But anyway, we did exactly like you're saying here. We went to Home Depot, uh, bought some bed bug bombs. And in this particular situation, there was a, um, and I think I even told you this before, Foster, but there, you know, this was an apartment on the second floor, an apartment on the first floor. We're working on the apartment on the second floor. And so we bombed the second floor apartment. And then shortly later, we hear from the downstairs tenant that's saying, hey, by the way, I have bed bugs and I've never had them before. And I don't know what you guys are doing up there. Um, but you know, they just traveled straight downstairs. So this problem in this particular situation really got out of hand. And I know there's a lot of different methods and probably maybe this is even one where you even recommend they do go to the professional, you know, that professional route. So kind of talk about bed bugs and, um, some of the, the problems that they cause and then like that extreme situation where you have to heat the whole place up to kill them. So just kind of, uh, talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say you're, you're absolutely right. Anytime you think you've got an infestation of bed bugs, don't do it yourself. It's just bottom line. Don't uh, the way the biology of this insect, the way it has become so resistant to chemicals, um, and how it's just such a good transporter, if you think you got bad bugs, call a professional. Just don't do it any other way um, because they're out of control. I mean, they're they're all over the world. Um, they're not subsiding at all. I mean, I think we've probably with the COVID and stuff, they've probably have calmed down a little bit because you know we're not doing so much excessive traveling as a whole. But they're they're still here and they're still a big issue. And it and it's something that we need to be mindful of. And yeah, if if the situation gets out of control. You know, volumetric heat is the best way, you know, especially like in an apartment, a hotel, motel, dorms. Volumetric heat, we found in here in the industry, is the best way to control bed bugs. Um, really, the resistance with chemicals is amazing, and you really won't know that you've got the issue until you're deep into it. And that's kind of one of the biggest mistakes that pest management professionals make is that they spray too much material. And if you do that with bed bugs, you're just going to exacerbate the situation pretty soon. Your bed bugs are going to migrate from one unit to another. You use a canned fog and they're going to migrate from one unit to another. So, um, you know, we really, in the industry, we, we really try to use volumetric heat as much as possible in the States where it is possible. If you get into like a single family home, a mobile home, you know, a, a standalone structure, actually doing a full structural fumigation is the best way because it's going to give you 100% elimination of those pests. Um, but not every state is going to allow structural fumigations for bed bugs. So you got to be mindful of that. But I would, I, I've done a lot of bed bug work um, being in the San Francisco Bay area where I'm at. We're kind of at the, the heart of bed bug central as far as in the West coast here. And I just done a lot and seen a lot and, Again, I cannot emphasize enough. If you think you got bed bugs, just stop. Call the pest professional. 
you're going to need to pay the money, unfortunately, to get it done right. And you really shouldn't try to do it yourself. So there are things, though, that you can do, Foster, right, with uh, do it yourself as far as carrying, you know, being aware of where to look for bed bugs when you are like in a hotel or staying over, you know, at someone else's house. Um, can you kind of explain, you know, what type of inspection that we should be doing when we're sleeping somewhere other than home? Yeah, I, I would say, Todd, with the... If you're going to like a hotel or motel, the first thing really you should do is strip the sheets off of the bed. Um, look around the seams of that mattress um, to see if you see any signs of bed bugs. And it's going to be very evident because you're either going to see the bug itself. It's about the size of an apple seed. Or you're actually going to see, you know, their fecal, which looks like somebody took a black permanent marker and put dots all over around the seam of that mattress. So... Um, that's going to be a real good telltale sign when you get into the, the hotel or the motel, um, looking at that mattress and then looking around the headboards as well, too, because you'll see again, that fecal, you'll see the live bed bugs and then do what you can to not put your clothes in the dresser that's in the hotel room. Keep it in your suitcase, put it in the suitcase stand. You could even, you know, best thing if you can, you know, put it in the bathroom of that hotel. That's going to be really good to, to help you out with that. Um, to make sure you're not bringing them back. And then when you get home from your vacation, all your clothes that you had in that suitcase, make sure you wash them in hot water, dry them in high heat um, that way. And do that immediately. Don't wait a day. Don't wait two days. Um, the suitcase that you used, um, try to wipe it out with a good disinfectant. Um, try to store it in a garage or some other storage place and don't store it in your house. And those are really going to be the best tips that you can do as far as when you're traveling, going somewhere where it's not in you know your home. And, and when you were talking about heat, you're saying hot water and dryers and, you know, um, they're really sensitive to heat, right? I mean, that's a, that kills them pretty much instantly, right? Yeah. So uh, 122 degrees will kill the, uh, will kill the eggs and the adults of the bed bug. So, but you have to sustain that heat. It can't be just, you know, like three to four minutes. It's really got to be a good 30 to 40 minutes like that to really make sure because yeah, we'll control them instantaneously, but sometimes it might take a little bit longer, but you really need to hold that heat to make sure that there's nothing funky going on. Cause it's, there's been research done, which is pretty wild of actually live bed bugs living under dead bed bugs when there's been like heat or chemical treatments being done. So they're, mm. they're pretty tenacious, pretty wild insect. Yeah. Wow. So they, they hide from the heat, even if it means staying underneath a, another dead bed bug, very, <laughs> disgusting yep. yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, it well, is yeah guys i can tell you you don't want to give it to anybody i mean you know if you think that uh reputation can definitely uh hurt you in any way i mean you give somebody bed bugs they're gonna remember that and probably tell everybody they know in yep. fact um they continue on with the uh the tenant story um that's what happened so this guy was single he was dating and uh, the rest is history. He gave it to his girlfriend. She took it to work, the bed bug. So yeah. um, definitely uh, get the professionals involved, but know what to look for exactly. uh, when you're sleeping out, making sure that you're not carrying those things back. And I want to talk about something. And this is disgusting too, but they're actually, I mean, can they carry disease? I mean, they actually bite you and suck the blood out of you, don't they? I mean, is that what these yeah. things do? Yeah, that's that's exactly what they do. I mean, that's really their only source of food is is blood. They have to they have to have a blood meal and it typically is going to be us. Yeah, in desperation, they will feed off of, uh, you know, wildlife and those pets. But really, it's going to be us humans. As far as them transmitting diseases, they don't transmit diseases. There's been a lot of studies that have been done. Um, there was actually a scare with a study that was done up in Canada, but that was proved to be extremely false once we really looked into it. So right now, the research and all that's been out there, they will not transmit diseases to people. And you'd think that they would. I mean, that's what I always thought when I was first dealing with them. It was like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that makes for a rough marriage, doesn't it? I mean, you're out there bringing all these pests home with you. Not good. How about mice? Do they eat bed bugs? Can you like bring some mice in the home to <laughs> go after those pesty bed bugs? They might. I mean, you never know. I mean... Rats and mice are weird. They they might. You just never know. But I don't think that's going to be their typical food that they're going to want. So, so this is a call that I get every year too with having apartments. I have a mouse in the in the apartment or a mouse in the house, and it's usually around you know the fall when temperatures outside start to get cooler, and you know 
inevitably in they come. And in fact, um, you could even ask my assistant about this because um, we've had mice in our office and we have our one, you know, uh, main office, our headquarters. It's a, actually an old farmhouse. It's 120 some years old. And, you know, I think it's kind of cool, you know, every now and then they see a little mouse run around the floor. She doesn't feel the same way, but how do we get rid of them other than glue traps and, you know, that kind of stuff it seems inhumane poisoning them. Yeah. Well, and, and again, just like with all pests, I mean, when you're looking on the outside of the structures making sure you're sealing up all those entry points, that's going to be the huge thing right there. Making sure those foundation vents are sealed up. That's going to be the huge thing right there. Making sure that there isn't a lot of debris and a lot of things on the outside to attract them near your home. Now, of course, you never know what's on the other side of your neighbor's yard. What could be going on with that? Not just mice, but rats as well, too. So that's really going to be your big way as far as making sure that you're taking care of any of those food, water, or harbage areas or on the outside for that mouse. Um, just get rid of any of that. Now, if, if you've got them inside the house, you know, unfortunately, yeah, you're going to really need to do something like a glue board or a snap trap. I would strongly suggest not using any bait at all inside a home because you don't know where that rodent's going to go die at and it will smell when it starts to decay. And then you're going to be like, where is it at? So us as pest management professionals, you know, we really try to use just the trapping. We try to do exclusion before we really get inside. But once they're inside, unfortunately, there's not much you can do, but using traps, um, putting something like that on the inside. But yeah, the, the poison, I can't, I can't emphasize enough. Don't put that on the out, you know, on mm. the inside. You can, you can you get a cat, right? Yeah, unfortunately, cats aren't, believe it or not, the greatest mousers in the world. I mean, you will you will get those one one or two cats that might be pretty aggressive with that. But in general, cats are pretty lazy. They they won't they won't be going after them. So, um, yeah, you could try, but I, I wouldn't recommend a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Just get a couple cats. Oh, so, if Foster, um, a lot of people, they do poison them. So if you poison the mouse and the mouse has the poison inside, and then your dog eats the mouse. Is there harm uh, to the dog? I mean, there's, are you poisoning your dog at the same time? Um, you can. There can be secondary poisoning. Um, that is that is a big concern with any rodenticide you put around. Um, when you're looking at rodenticides that we have available in the industry, we have what we call first-generation rodenticides, which are a little bit more toxic. Um, they usually take a couple of feedings to, to you know, have the animal uh, succumb to the poison. And then you got second generation poisons, which generally are single feeding. And then now we have ones which work actually on the nerves of the um, of the rodents. So, if you've got any dogs, cats, anything like that in and around your home, I wouldn't use poison at all because there could be that chance of secondary poisoning. Um, here in California, we're actually going through something right now uh, where we have second generation rodenticides have been banned in the state of California. Um, they can no longer be used. Um, there's a re tight restriction on them. Uh, if there is a special case, we can we can put in um, basically a plea to use it, but it's they're pretty much going away and it's because they've been misused, not just by the pest management professional, but by homeowners and other people as well, too. So um you know, I, again, I would not use rodenticides at all inside a home. If you've got pets, just don't do it. Cause now besides a mouse making a 200 pound man jump up on the chair, yeah. <laughs> um, are they, you know, do you have to worry about them biting you? I mean, do you hear cases of mice or are they more timid and just want to stay the heck away? I would say with any wildlife, you have to have the concern as far as them biting you. I mean, if they're going to feel threatened, even though they typically, you know, mice don't do that, you get them in excess, you get them cornered, you never know what they're going to do. So they could easily do that. They could easily bite you. And then you're not going to know if they've got, you know, rabies or some other disease that they're going to transmit to you. So I would say if you find a mouse live in your house and you try cornering it in the and trying to sweep it up in a garbage can don't do that because you just never know with wildlife what it's going to yeah. do you just you don't know so i would just say don't do and that. you just alluded to one of my questions is <clears throat> do they carry disease yeah they can i mean all rodents have have i mean not just rats and mice but you're talking everything from you know the squirrels to the gophers and everything else 
um, any wildlife has got diseases. So you all got to be careful with that. I mean, mice, um, you know, you get into deer mice, which typically won't come in the house. You're gonna have to worry about the hunter virus, which that's a whole nother topic that we could have a whole nother show on. Um, but there's various diseases that they could carry that you need to be concerned about. You just won't know what they have. Um, because again, it's a wildlife. So you just, you won't know. And that's why you want to just really stay away from them. If you see them in your house and they're alive or whatever, just don't try to get them yourself alive. Put some traps out, let nature kind of take its course on that. All right. And then guys, for those of you that like snakes, maybe you could get a snake to get the mice. That are in your uh, there house. you go. There you go. Well, that might work. Yeah. Personally, I'd rather have the lazy cat and you know, yeah. uh, I can't stand snakes. So no. uh, I'll tell you a little story. So my wife and I are on a trip to New York city. Uh, we actually just dropped my youngest daughter off at this uh, summer school in New York uh, for film actually. And we're coming back. We're in the quiet car on the Excella Amtrak and my older, oldest daughter's at home by herself. And again, we're in the quiet car and my wife picks up the phone. My daughter's calling and it wasn't very quiet anymore. You could hear her screaming probably throughout the entire car. Um, she found the snake in the house and we, she has a cat and, um, uh, so the cat actually found the snake or was underneath the, you know, looking under the stove and really carrying on. And so my daughter said, hmm, what's underneath the stove and sees this big black snake uh, that hissed at her. And she ended up on top of the kitchen island until my friend could come, you know, an hour later um, that I knew would be able to catch this snake. And he did. And it was like a six foot black snake. And they're not poisonous. They will bite you. Um, I hear it's like a cat bite. I don't know. I've never actually witnessed a black, you know, been subjected to a black snake bite, but um, that would, that did completely freak me out. And I'm on the Excel train, you know, a hundred miles away. So um, how does somebody get rid of snakes in their house and how in the world would they do this on their own if they hate snakes as much as I do? Yeah. Um, I really would say if, if there's a snake in the house, I mean, you really should be calling somebody to do that. I mean, trying to get it yourself because, yeah, in your circumstance, I mean, you, you kind of knew that that black snake wasn't poisonous or whatever, but trying to repel them or keep them out of your house, it, again, is sealing up stuff on the outside, but trying to get rid of him yourself. If you got a snake in the house, I mean, I would call a wildlife specialist. I mean, because you don't, you, you don't know. I mean, you, you knew in that circumstance that, you know, that black snake wasn't poisonous, but you just never know with a snake uh, what it could be. And I wouldn't want to take that chance with that. So if you see that you've got them in the house, I mean, I would say that, like, again, call the wildlife specialist. Um, there really isn't any that I know of as far as good snake repellent that's going to keep them out. Because with any material or anything we're using, you know, the pest could get used to it. Any of the ultrasonic stuff, which we haven't touched on, pests can get used to that. Um, I wouldn't buy any of those ultrasonics just because of, there's just a myriad of reasons we could go into with that. But um, snakes are a whole nother deal and I haven't really dealt with them, thank goodness, um, that much. I mean, the one or two cases that I've had with them, you know, it's basically putting down a glue board around the outside for 24 hours and seeing if we catch anything and good, great, we didn't or we did. And that would be done with it. So luckily I haven't had to get that call with that they're inside the house and what do we got to do with it? Cause if I ever got that call, I think I would just say, Hey, call, call wildlife <laughs> specialist. They're going to know what to do. They're going to know how to identify that snake, make sure that it's not poisonous, make sure that it's not going to harm stuff. Cause you know, here in California, you get up in the Hills and stuff, we've got rattlesnakes, you know, people live up in the Hills, people live up in, you know, I don't want to say the wilderness, but you know, areas where these poisonous snakes can be and these ones that could, could do harm so you really need to be careful with that and i guess a lot of it is once again eliminating the food source so if you have a snake that's inside your house it's probably coming in for a mouse or your cat or something yeah, exactly. i don't know something maybe like your domestic uh pet uh, but again keeping them and so we know what happened in my situation so when we had replaced the deck and when we pulled the deck up where the gas line came in the house was actually, it wasn't even caulked. I mean, it was 
basically a wide open hole that the snake could come in and out of. And we actually sealed it up. So we think what happened was we sealed it up when the snake was inside. Uh, we haven't had any trouble since it's been a couple years now, but um, definitely make sure that uh, you either have MacGyver as your neighbor um, mm -hmm. or as a friend that can come and get that snake out of your house or like Foster said, call somebody else because they can bite you and they can be poisonous. So yep. bats, here's another one. Guys, I can't stand, I mean, we've had bats in our attic before. If you live in Maryland or you're moving to Maryland, you know, check us out before you come because we have all these things. Everything we're mentioning here, we have bats, snakes, all kinds of stuff. So um, as I'm sure you do too, but what's the deal with bats? How do you get them out of your house? Yeah, bats can be tricky because like you said, they can be up in the attic. I mean, they can even just kind of hang out right near the, the front door area, near the eaves and everything. So they're really kind of a tricky one. Um, as far as homeowners trying to get them out, I wouldn't do it because again, there could be rabies, there could be stuff with those bats. So, you know, Again, it all goes back to this integrated pest management, making sure that you're sealing up, you know, those uh, those roof vents because that's how they're going to get into the attic. You know, basically, if you got the the vent on the outside of the home that um, basically has the you know circulating the air through the attic and stuff, um, you know, they could just get up in through those. So those are going to be the best way to to really get rid of bats and to make sure you're not coming in your home. Other than that, there's really not much you can do. Again, you know it's kind of hard with bats to really eliminate any food source because they could be coming from anywhere to look for any small thing. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you've got a lot of them around your house and stuff, then you're going to need to try to do some exclusion work. And a lot of that exclusion work might need to be done by a professional because it might involve putting up some sort of physical barrier or something. So that way the bat can't hang on the eave area. You know, it might involve something more extensive as far as, fixing roof fence or something like that. And sometimes that can get a little tricky for homeowners to get up on that ladder, um, might not be that accessible and stuff. So, um, yeah, bats are, bats are a pain. They're, they're not a fun thing. If they get in the attic, we do have in the industry, we do have, um, you know, kind of like these one way tunnels that you can put where we know where there's an entry point and the bat can fly out, but it can't come back in. So a lot of times when we're doing bat exclusion, we'll put those up as well. Uh, make sure that bats have, are all out of the attic before we do any sealing of anything. Uh, that way we're not trapping anything in there because then that could just be a mess. Then you could start having, you know, the mites from the droppings to fleas to anything like that to live bats running around your attic and you're wondering what's flapping around up there. So um, they're, they're, they're a tricky one to, again, to get control of. And I would, I would say call a specialist, call a wildlife specialist, somebody that does exclusion for that and, don't try to handle uh, bats yourself. It's not a good You thing. know, I hear all these stories about people having bats in their house. And, um, you know, they're, of course, they're blind. So that, you know, term blind as a bat came from that, right? <laughs> so, you know, they're flying around in your house. And I think one of the ways that they um, kind of get their direction is when they actually like spit, right? Or they kind of sneeze, so to speak, to listen to the sound waves of, to when, you know, how long it takes for it to hit that barrier. And then they know when, you know, they need to fly in another direction. So there's a lot of stories that circulate about how they're in their children's room or in their bedroom. And then they go and get this extensive rabies vaccine to just be safe. Um, you know, make sure that they, they haven't been exposed to rabies through the bat spit. Yeah. I mean, do you, is that kind of like, over inflated or overrated i mean you know when you are called to somebody's home that has bats i mean what do you tell them other than hey we'll try and get them out of your house yeah i mean i would say doing something like that is kind of like a little over the top um you know yeah bats we are we're gonna are gonna really work off of the ultrasonic sounds uh reverberations and stuff and they might do that as you said there with their saliva and everything but as far as somebody getting like the rabies shot and because there's a bat flying around the house, I mean, that's a little bit of overkill. I think really getting rid of the bat, trying to find out how that they got into the home is going to be the best thing. And that's really what I'm going to tell the homeowner is just 
you know, try not to do anything on your own. We need to get rid of the bats. We need to get them out of your house so you don't have to worry about this. And yeah, if your child hasn't had, you know, rabies vaccine or something like that, I mean, it'd be a good idea to do that. So do they give know. children rabies vaccines now? No, I don't think they do. It's kind of an awful thing, but you know. Yeah, I, I I know uh, someone that actually got scratched by their kid got scratched by a cat, a wild cat, and yeah. it was like a series of shots. Man, it was no fun. I mean, I think yep. it's I think it's quite painful. But then again, I mean, the downside is rabies. There's no cure, right? So I mean, yeah. if you get rabies, don't you just die at that point? I think you I pretty think. much can once once you get the yeah. rabies. Yeah, you're pretty much done for. So yeah. So if you guys have bats in your house, don't mess around with them. You know, make sure you're calling the professionals in on something like that. But certainly, like Foster's saying, seal up those entry points. I think that's a big thing, common thread through all these pests. Now, we're going to talk about something we have here in Maryland. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about termites. Because here we have a saying that there are three types of homes. One is the home that has termites. One is that will get termites or one that has had termites and termites are these wood boring insects. And I know that in order to get a loan here in Maryland, I don't know about California, but you have to actually have a wood boring insect inspection and they're looking for termites because they can do a lot of damage. And in fact, in rehabbing, I've taken plaster off of walls and drywall off of walls, uh, moving walls and putting windows in. Um, and sometimes the termite infestation was so bad that the two by fours in the walls can actually just put your hand through and crumble um, into dust. So Foster, what can you tell us about termites? Yeah, termites are another one of those ones that I would say don't try to treat them on your own because just like you were saying, you know, you took off the plaster and everything. You saw that two by four and they, they're just they're just all inside the, the two by four and you got galleries just to go go just everywhere. Um, termites are, are again, you know, there is even here in California, like you said, you know, there's those houses that had termites, uh, the houses that, you know, possibly could have termites. And then those that don't, I mean, it really, that it's so true. I mean, anytime that a home, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what it is with other States. I mean, I know here in California, yeah, you need to make sure you have a home inspection. You need to make sure there's no wood destroying organisms in there. Um, definitely I would recommend not just having a home inspector do, uh, the inspection for, you know, wood destroying organisms and other items. I would have that home inspector just do the home inspection for other items. And I would call in a pest control operator to inspect for termites, because there's a lot of things you need to look at with that. Um, the, the termites can be very, very destructive. And even sometimes, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, the, the pest management professionals sometimes can miss things, which we're trained not to, but there's they can be elusive like you said you could have something deep in a wall void there could be something in a two by four i mean we do have a lot of tools these days that really can figure out the heat signature and moisture where termites might be at so that's going to help out a lot um as far as that but um they're they're definitely not something you really want to try to do on your own because you got to get back where the galleries are where the nest of the termites are at and just kind of trying to do a perimeter spray or trying to put something in a wall where you might think it's at, there could be a lot more that's going on. And depending on the infestation and the type of you know termites you have, you're gonna you're probably gonna end up having to do a full structural fumigation and putting that gas in there. There's just no other way to get control of them because you've got the dry wood termites and they're all over the place. So um so what can uh homeowners do i mean can they i mean a lot of it is moisture related right so they should be making sure that i guess is it important to know where your actual sill is in the house i mean you know a lot of times you know when you have um either a, a block foundation you know cinder blocks or you have concrete foundation there is a board then that goes on top of that it should be pressure treated depending on how old the structure is and it's called the sill plate and a lot of times people will pile mulch and things like that and soil up over that sill plate so you know what i always recommend is that people know where that sill plate is located and keep things below that grade 
and then also making sure that the water is properly flowing around away from your foundation, especially around your downspouts, your gutters and your downspouts, making sure that they're a good five, six feet away from the foundation area. And, um, and then any other helpful uh, hints? No, that's, that's pretty much it. What you touched on. I mean, that's, that's, that's the biggie. The moisture is the big thing. And like you said, definitely. And again, this all goes back to this integrated pest management is, is keeping those conditions at bay and away from the house. And that's one of the things, yeah. Know where that sill plate is, know where the top of that is, making sure your stuff, keeping stuff below grade and not just, yeah, right up near the house. That's going to be huge. Um, Cause that moisture will just tear them apart. And, you know, and I'd, I'd recommend with a lot of people too. I mean, they might think that it's overkill, but you know, I would say every, you know, two, three years of the Mac, you know, get in and have a professional do an inspection for termites at your house because that ounce of prevention is is going to be huge for you. And you might detect something. If you just been in the house 20 or 30 years and you haven't had an inspection done, you might find a lot of things that are going to cost you a lot of money. So, yeah, um, and they definitely will. I've seen termite damage really cost homeowners, especially when they go to sell, they find this damage. Um, like you said, get somebody in there every couple of years to check it out um, and really avoid big structural repairs yep. uh, when it comes time to uh, to selling your home. Um, and lastly, let's talk about carpenter bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are those are another fun one. Um, you know, interesting fact with it. A lot of them that you're going to see flying around will be the uh, will be the males and stuff and they really won't sting. So, you know wherever you see the carpenter bees at a lot of times you see them along the fence post um you know basically your rails of uh around your patios and stuff you're going to see it looks like somebody drilled some holes in in there and that's where the carpenter bees are going to be at and yeah you could try doing some self-treatment with that um i definitely would do it you know either early morning before the sun comes up or late at night um again you could try to get some boric acid or some dust and put it up into that hole but a lot of times that should end up controlling it um, then you can put some, you know, wood putty over that hole and it, that should take care of it after you treat it. Um, again, it's one of those weird, what we call an occasional invader that we're not going to deal with a lot, but it can be pretty, can be pretty destructive, you know? Um, do your typical bee sprays, uh, kill the carpenter bees? They, they can't, they can, but a lot of times you're not going to have like a wasp or a hornet nest where you can actually kind of spray that down. A lot of times they're going to be in those galleries. So using that dust product is going to be the best thing. Trying to like spray them while they're in the air. That's, you know, if you leave them alone, they're not going to harm you. They're not going to do anything to you at all. Yeah. And we see this mostly with people with wood sided houses. So mm -hmm. um, if you have wood siding, chances are um, you might find some of these holes that, um, that Foster's referring to. Well, so, uh, that's it, guys. There you have it. Eight pests that could be inside invading your home and uh, making you uncomfortable. Uh, hopefully uh, tonight you learned a little bit about these uh, pesty things. And uh, if you have any questions, reach out to Foster. Foster, thank you so much. This was great. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Hopefully this helped out some homeowners and kind of give them some direction. That's right. And we'll have all Foster's information in the content below and see you next week. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.